actually start recording that. I need, I need, I need two of those. I need, or I need all. Yeah, there should be. Are there extras floating around? Still. Okay. There. I need. Actually, I need one, one more. Yeah. Pass them around. Okay. So. Oh. Why is this not on duplicate? This is very annoying. There we go. Cool. So at the very beginning of class, I think the first day of lecture, I had shown this a couple images from the de Havilland comet. So this uh, was the the one of the first commercial aircrafts, and it was one that had a very catastrophic failure, where you can see some of the fatigue cracks that initiated at the corners of these not square but not quite round windows. Um, so that idea of stress concentrations, remember it was a factor of three for a perfect circle, it's higher for something that's not perfectly circular. And in their initial design of these aircraft, they had made it so that the, so aircraft are pressurized and depressurized as you go up and down, so it goes through these cyclic pressurization cycles. Um, they accounted for the stress at the corner to not cause failure initially, but what they hadn't accounted for was the fatigue that would uh, result from the continuous pressure cycling going up and down and up and down. And eventually the, the fatigue combined with a fracture process caused the whole fuselage to rip in half. So this was one of those examples. Uh, depending on the material you use, fracture can be a gradual or catastrophic process. So this is a silicon wafer being cleaved. So this is um, all of your electronic chips are built on silicon wafers. So. Uh, they have them at different sizes, generally like half a millimeter to 0.75 millimeters thick. Um, and then they print electronic circuits on them. But for splitting them into pieces, now you can see this guy is going to have, he's going to take a diamond scribe and just apply a very low pressure at the corner of this thing. So he's going to take a very sharp diamond tool. Um, and he's explaining some stuff, talking about things. There we go. Okay. And what you'll see is fracture. So right there, you can see now he's using that diamond scribe, applying a very small force, and getting a very nice, clean, long, brittle fracture process. So this is actually, well, this is, is one of the ways that they can cleave uh, silicon chips. And so what, what's actually happening is silicon is a, is a very intrinsically brittle material. Uh, and so it's, it's just forming two clean new surfaces right along one of the crystal planes of the silicon wafer. Normally the crystal slip, or this crystal system, let's go through that. Normally the crystal system is oriented in the 111 direction pointing out of the wafer, so you'll get an angle, a, a failure kind of at a, I think a 30 degree-ish angle uh, along one of the slip planes, and it, it always kind of forms it at one of those angles because that corresponds with the maximum uh, or the close packed plane of the crystal in the silicon. Um, but you can see fracture can initiate very rapidly and very catastrophically. So this is for an intrinsically brittle material like silicon. It can also happen with not so brittle materials. So this is a hydrogel. This is a test uh, by out of Jigong Suo's group in Harvard. Uh, and he tests soft materials. So this is now a uh, crack propagating through a hydrogel, where you can see it. It'll undergo a lot of extension. So this is uh, like a tougher version of jello, effectively. Something that's 99% water with some stuff in the middle to hold it all together. And eventually it'll reach a critical stress where, there we go, we see fracture propagate through. So let's go back to see that process happen again. So you see it's loading up, it's loading up. There's a stress concentration there at the root of the, of the crack there. And eventually it reaches a critical stress and fracture. So depending on the material system, uh, that, so, so today what we'll go through is some of the different types of fracture, some of the background and theory behind fracture. Um, and then how that fracture depends on the type of material that we're using. So um, 
I have a few pieces of paper in front of you that I'm going to have you all do an experiment with in a second. But um, before that, so, so fracture mechanics in general is the study of how cracks propagate in materials. So study of study of crack propagation in materials. It's probably one of the most important areas of study because every material or effectively every material has some amount of flaws in it, some cracks, some voids, some imperfections, and uh, fracture is a very common failure mode uh, to occur. So. Uh, for ductile metals, for example, you, you will get yielding initially, but the final failure of a material is, is fracture dominated, generally, unless you have something that's very, very ductile. But that's why, that's what you see the roughness on the surface um, of post-fracture specimens. And so the lab next, ooh, not next week, the week after next week, um, we'll do a lab demo on a Charpy impact test uh, to, sh to show you a brittle to ductile transition in steels. Uh, and so you'll you'll get to see basically the differences in fracture surfaces with different degrees of brittleness in the material, um, and how that how those energy absorption processes work. But um, for the study of fracture, we're going to boil it down and start really simple. So there's three different fracture modes that we can look at. So uh, fracture modes. There's very uh, very creatively named mode one, two, and three. I know. Uh, so mode one is a is a tension mode. It's an opening mode. So this is mode one. If I have a crack now in a plate and I'm pulling it with some stress, um, this is an opening mode. This is called mode one because it's also the most common fracture mode to happen. Um, most common, and it's how most materials break. Uh, and so, because this uh, this tension mode, this opening mode, is, is generally generally one of the weaker modes. Um, it is is it is often the, the governing fracture mode in materials, but it's not necessarily the only one that people look at. The second one uh, is mode two, mode two, and this is mode. mode or uh, a sliding mode. Sliding mode. And so this is actually how most machining processes work. How machining, machining works. So if you can imagine having, uh, now I'm going to draw a chip being cut off of a off of a sample. So for those of you who have done some work in the machine shop, which I imagine is most of you at this point, maybe, maybe not. Um, so uh, the two the main machining operations, milling and lathing, uh, you have a sharp tool bit that comes and kind of scrapes the surface of a part. Uh, and that scraping process, you have a, a sharp edge coming and removing a thin layer of material from the top of it. This is actually a mode two sh uh, fracture. So it's, it's causing a shear on the surface that's then uh, causing fracture to happen. So you can imagine now there's kind of a, a shear stress here that's forcing this material to fracture. And so depending on the shear or the mode two shear fracture resistance of the material, it's easier or more difficult to, to machine. You actually want something that's sort of ductile so it doesn't just shatter, but not too tough that it is impossible to break. Um, and then the final mode, mode three, because again, engineers are super creative with their naming conventions, uh, is a tearing mode. So uh, these, uh, these are arrows pointing in and out of the plane now. Mode 
three, and this is a tearing mode. And so this is common for thin sheets, common for thin sheets, and it's how scissors work. So you can imagine now, so now we have uh, these different pieces of paper. Uh, I'm going to show you all three and I'm going to have you check one of them out. For these different failure modes, there are different crack propagation pathways that generally take place. Um, so mode one, which is the easiest one, you can see now I have my, um, my sandwich piece of paper. What I can do is, is try to pull uniformly on this surface and I should see um, a nice clean fracture go through the material. So the max stress is there at the, at the notch uh, and it propagates down and along there. Mode two, so this is now my second piece of paper, is a shearing mode. So I'm gonna shear it this way and I'm gonna see if I can get, um, I should get like a 45 degree angle break if I do this correctly. Um, if I can actually, this is a harder one to, there we go, cool. So I have this 45 degree angle break because that happens to be where the max stress is there that's gonna cause failure, the max tensile stress along that notch in the loading in this loading state. Um, I broke the corner too. And then the third one is probably the easiest. Uh, this is now our, our tearing mode. So I have that um, this half piece of paper and I can just kind of tear it along there. And again, I get that nice clean fracture along the surface. So you can test out any one of those three that you'd like to see which direction your piece of paper breaks. Forty-five degrees. I mean, piece is bigger. Yeah. It. Yeah, because it's the. <laughs> it's a little bit hard to do after the after the first time. <laughs> so we'll get into that. It's it's there's always some pre-existing cracks, um, and it's basically the biggest one that will cause failure to happen. So, how many of you actually got that 45 degrees for this year? Cool. Ish. 45-ish. Cool. <laughs> yeah. But so now, uh, anytime you, say, use a piece of, uh, use scissors to cut a piece of paper, you can imagine now that that tearing is actually the, the scissors coming in and acting and, and shearing that paper in that mode 3 state. Um, yeah. So. Let's talk a little bit about some of the theory of it now. So we had talked uh, two days ago about stress concentrations. So now I'm going to go back to that, some of that stress concentration analysis to help motivate the fracture processes. So let's look at stress concentrations. Cool. So. Now, I had, I had drawn that plate getting pulled uh, with some elliptical crack in it with height, um, this is now 2A, and width 2B, and there's some far field applied stress on this. And I had shown, or I had, I had given you the relationship before that the, the max stress here at the top, sigma max, is equal to the far field applied stress, sigma naught, uh, one plus A over B, A over B, or two, two A over B. There we go. But then, so now what, what we want to be looking at is, is very sharp cracks. So you can imagine for these sharp cracks, this is now very, effectively a very high aspect ratio ellipse. So it doesn't, so now I, I had also shown that as, um, as B is, is much less than A, then my sigma max would theoretically go to infinity, which isn't necessarily realistic because 
I just showed you a piece of paper with a crack in it and it didn't just shatter um, a quantifying load. So what we're going to look at now instead is uh, the radius of curvature here at the notch and I'm going to rewrite this equation using that. So I can define a constant, um, I'm going to call this rho, which is the, the radius of curvature of curvature which is b squared over a no <coughs> yep b squared over a over a at this corner of the ellipse um, and so I can use that to replace now uh, my a over b so I can say um, a over b is also equal to the square root of a squared over b squared which I'm going to replace that b squared over a and say that this is the square root of a over rho in this. So now I can rewrite this whole equation, that sigma max, in terms of my radius of curvature. So now I can say that the maximum stress uh, is sigma naught, 1 plus 2 square root of a over rho which I'm, I'm taking a direct substitution based on that radius of curvature, or now that this is proportional to, um, now as, as rho becomes very small, this is proportional to sigma naught square root of A. So for all of our fracture analyses, because, so bas basically you have to be able to, blah, there we go, uh, you have to be able to make a measurement for some of these, uh, for your parts. And because this radius of curvature can change very significantly depending on exactly how the crack formed, whether it was intentionally included, whether it was a, a nucleation event, but it's easy to measure the length of the crack, or easier to measure the length of the crack, um, especially for something that's a high aspect ratio. And so most of our fracture analysis will be based on this square root of A because physically that's the easiest thing to measure. So <clears throat> let's get into some of the history of fracture. So let's look at a historical perspective. So fracture in materials had been around for, a, I mean, it's, it's one of the most prevalent things that happens to materials. But it, as a, as a study, hadn't really been started actually until the First World War. So there was a guy, Griffith, um, Griffith, uh, where in, 19, in the 1920s, 1920s, so this was World War I, he started studying scratches in glass rods. So there was... Um, scratches in glass. So there was some practical application of this during the war. It actually didn't catch on very much at the time because people were like, all right, why are you studying glass? We're trying to make tanks out of, out of steel and aluminum and uh, bombs. Why are, you, why are you doing this investigation to begin with? Um, but this was kind of historically where it started. So he started finding, he would take these long glass rods um, and he would introduce a crack into the side of them. So he would just introduce these tiny little scratches, and these scratches were length A into the side of these glass rods. Um, and he started noticing, so, well, he noticed first uh, that glass would fail, glass failed around a fracture strength of like 100 MPa, 100 megapascals. Uh, which is reasonably high, but it wasn't great. And so he, he started noticing that, or started realizing that this was important because uh, sometime prior to that, there had been some theory that came out on the theoretical strength of materials. So this was, I think in your book, this is chapter 9.2, where they actually go into some of the theory of this. But basically, if you, if you have a packing of atoms in a material, the theoretical strength of that material is the strength that it takes to rip those atoms apart. So the, the theoretical strength, sigma theoretical, is something on the order of like, depending on exactly how you do your analysis, 
e over pi or um, e over 10 or so somewhere in that ballpark. So uh, the Young's modulus of glass is like 50 gigapascals. So we would expect something theoretically for glass, sigma theoretical for glass is on the order of actually 10,000 megapascals. And so this prior to uh, prior to this this study Griffith noticed that there was this large discrepancy between these two values. So he's like, well, theoretically this this glass should be a lot stronger than it actually is um, than we're seeing. And so he wanted to try to figure out why that was the case. And so what he did was he started introducing these scratches into glass and he noticed he found that um, by studying diff scratches of different sizes, he found that the fracture strength was proportional to that square root of A. So the deeper he cut a crack into the material, or the deeper he cut a scratch into the material, the, deep, uh, the, the weaker the fracture strength was. So he came up with a theory around this, and he proposed that because this is glass, uh, and this is a brittle material, basically what you were doing energetically was forming a new surface. So the fracture strength then was dependent on the energy that it took to form a new surface. So he proposed, proposed this relationship, sigma f uh, square root of a is approximately equal to square root of 2e gamma over pi, where e is the Young's modulus, Young's modulus, and gamma is a surface energy now. And so that E for glass um, is, a, is around, say, 62 gigapascals, and the surface energy for glass is around one joule per meter squared. And so from that, he, he was able to obtain a reasonable analysis or a reasonable prediction of what the fracture strength of glass was just because, basically he said, because when you, when you crack these things open for a brittle material like that silicon wafer that we saw, all of that energy is just going into forming those two new surfaces. And so <coughs> for a brittle material, this is actually a pretty good approximation. Um, the problem is most of our engineering materials aren't necessarily brittle. Um, but this was, this was historically when it first started getting looked at. And so now the bigger the scratch is, the, the weaker the material is, and all of that is uh, from this theory due to it causing, taking less energy to form a new surface. So after that, this, this theory kind of sat around for a little while, um, or no, let's write. So from Griffith theory, uh, we're going to define now a, a, a fracture or a, a stress intensity factor. So uh, for the stress concentration, I had showed a, a KT, which was the ratio between the maximum stress and the far field applied stress. Here we're going to use a similar idea and we're going to define a stress intensity factor. So um, we're going to define a stress intensity factor K stress intensity factor, uh, I'm going to call this K, and then I'm going to use some subscript depending on which mode of fracture I'm looking at. So there's a K1, uh, K2, and K3 for all of those different fracture modes. And I'm going to say that this stress intensity, K1, is now equal to the far field applied stress and then the square root of a pi a. And so depending now on the length of the crack, the square root of a and the far field applied stress, there's just some stress intensity in the material. So there's some k1 in the material that's going to cause it to fracture. Um, and so then uh, the, the bigger question now, I think, is we're going to kind of ignore this, uh, this row dependence in our material. So we're now going to ignore all of that, uh, the, the sharpness of the crack. So how do we actually figure out um, where failure is going to happen in a material 
just based on that size of the crack. We don't know now what the stress intensity is. And so it turns out for most materials that doesn't necessarily matter because most materials have some ductility. So the next big historical jump uh, in fracture mechanics was developed by Irwin, uh, a guy, I think last name Irwin, uh, in the 1950s who worked for the Naval Research Lab. Uh, Irwin, 1950s, and he worked for Naval Research Lab. And he started looking into, so, so Griffith's theory was, was good for brittle materials, but again, not necessarily useful for all of the materials. So he wanted to look now into what happens around a, some, some ductile material around the tip of a crack. So he started looking now into, um, into ductility structure, to ductility in fracture processes. And he found that around the tip of the crack, there was some region where there was plastic deformation. So you didn't necessarily see, um, like in that silicon wafer, you don't necessarily see a catastrophic brittle crack propagate immediately. Even around a very sharp crack, you see some amount of deformation, some amount of plasticity uh, near the tip of that, and then eventually fracture starts to happen. So this is more like that hydrogel that we saw, where the, the, the crack can deform and open up a lot before it actually propagates through the material. Um, and so this this plastic zone size then depends on whether or we're in a state of plane stress or plane strain, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But um, what he started to see was that from that Griffith theory, we expect now the stress near the tip of the crack. So from the tip of the crack going out some distance are, uh, we expect a, a one over square root of A dependence on the stress. So we expect that stress to kind of go up exponentially, um, but that's not actually what happens. In reality, there's some plastic yield strength near the crack, and then that will start to decay out until we get to a far field stress. And then it'll start to actually approximate that, um, this one over square root of A dependence on the crack size. So here now to actually account for this, um, this plastic zone, plastic zone, what he did was he took Griffith's theory and he started to modify it. So, um, or sorry, this is a one over square root of R. Square root of R, if I can erase things, one over square root of R. And so he started to modify that Griffith's crack theory uh, and said now, uh, the stress modified Griffith theory said that the stress, uh, the fracture stress for a material square root of A was equal instead of square root of E gamma, he had E G over pi, uh, where this G now is not the shear modulus, it's uh, the plastic energy release rate, which might be confusing and I'm gonna apologize in advance for using the same symbols. Um, but this is this is a, a thing called the plastic energy G release rate. And this G is equal to the surface energy of the material. Uh, so I still have that two gamma plus some extra constant to account for plasticity. So this is our surface energy, and this is additionally plastic energy dissipation. Energy dissipation. And so now in a brittle material, we actually return back to that same Griffith theory. We still say this is uh, two E gamma over pi. Um, here we go. And so we still have that, that Griffith theory work for, for a brittle material, but along with that, if we have a ductile material, the ductility around the crack tip is actually absorbing a lot of energy, 
uh, and that can significantly change the, the critical stress that you need to apply for fracture to occur. And so, okay, cool. So depending now on which material we have, this plastic energy can take place in different ways. It can uh, form differently in different materials. So um, now if we want to look at, say, um, different materials, so let's say like a metal, let's look at, let's move this over. Um, let's look at metal, metal plasticity around the tip of the crack, we kind of have a nice uniform zone of plastic deformation where this whole thing will start to, to plastically deform uh, around a polymer. What we have is actually uh, something called brazing. So um, what you'll end up seeing, and there's some nice pictures of this in your book, brazing uh, is so, so in a metal, we have uh, the same fracture processes or the same plasticity processes we've been talking about. There's this thing about thing, and I showed you uh, sometime toward the beginning of the class, there was that molecular dynamics video that I showed where you see all the dislocations emanating around the crack tip. It might actually be good to pull up now. Um, around a polymer, because you have this sort of molecular spaghetti, what actually happens is in that plastic zone, the molecules will get stretched out and you'll, you'll see molecules getting stretched out across the tip of the crack. Um, and so this you get this crazing phenomena um, where you have long strands of, of polymer getting stretched across. And they have some, again, some good illustrations in the Myers and Chala book of that happening. Um, for ceramics, uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but if you have now a sharp crack, um, you have some effective damage zone here where inside you may have some micro cracks or smaller scale cracks and these smaller scale cracks or inclusions can actually start to um, form different form and these these are an energy absorption mechanism um, so for that for glass or for single crystalline uh, brittle materials so glass doesn't have a microstructure it's just amorphous um, and single crystalline silica, single crystalline, so there's no, uh, there's very few defects, so there's none of these microstructural processes that can happen, but uh, in a normal ceramic you can get this, this micro-cracking phenomena that actually is absorbed some of the energy. Actually ceramics, there's a whole lot of stuff you can do to absorb energy, but this is one of the more prevalent ones. And so um, now for our fracture analysis, what we actually have to do in order to, to obtain material parameters is ensure that the plastic zone size is small relative to the total part. So in order to now perform a valid fracture test, um, do, 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 to perform a valid fracture test, Uh, the size of the plastic zone must be small relative to the part. Size of plastic zone must be small relative to part. So now what we want to do in, in the study of fracture is look at how cracks move and how cracks propagate in materials. And so in order to do that, um, we need to make sure that the plasticity around the crack tip isn't actually dominating the behavior uh, and that we can find now how that crack, crack propagates according to our, to our linear elastic theory, this, this one over square root of R theory. Um, and so now when we actually get a fracture toughness for a material, so fracture toughness, toughness. We obtain this from experiments and we say there's some stress concentration factor Ki which is from the geometry from geometry 
uh, and it's proportional to that square root of a. So the, the length of the crack. Then there's some critical stress intensity, some KIC, which is a uh, critical stress intensity, uh, which is now what we're going to call a material property. So for a material, for fa failure to occur, let's move some stuff around. Here we go. So now in, in doing a fracture test, what we are going to look at is if I have, say, a plate with a crack in the middle of it, um, and I'm going to call this crack 2A by convention because a side crack is length A, so a middle crack is 2A. And I have some far field applied stress sigma naught. Um, I'm going to say failure, so this, this sigma naught um, is equal to Ki over the, or the, the stress intensity square root of pi A. Uh, which I had shown somewhere before from that Griffith definition of, of stress intensity. So we're, we're defining our stress intensity factor based on that, the length of the crack here. And the failure will occur in the material when this uh, reaches a KIC. So when, when KI is equal to KIC, then failure happens. And so for now there's there's effectively two ways to look at when failure will happen for a given uh, for a given far field stress with a fixed crack size or for a given uh, or for a fixed right fixed far field stress given crack size or fixed crack size and given far field stress. So now in order to determine failure, failure, we can say that KIC is sigma naught square root pi A. Um, so if I, I, I can now figure out when fracture is going to happen either based on how big my crack is or how big that stress is in the material. For a bigger crack, I can apply less stress for, um, or for a smaller crack, and I, I can apply a higher stress. So now for some different materials, I'm going to throw um, just a couple relationships up here. So it'd probably be better to to pull up the three plot of materials, which I think I might want to do. I can write a couple down really quick. So for some different materials, uh, different E and different KIC. So let's say I have a uh, ductile steel, uh, 70, 75, aluminum, uh, soda lime glass. Glass and um, ABS, which is a uh, plastic. Uh, the modulus of this in terms of gigapascals is 270, 60, and 1. There we go. So now, um, out of these materials, ah, damn, I was supposed to make a pull everywhere for this. Um, so out of these materials, uh, which, which do you think will have the highest fracture toughness, and which do you think will have the lowest fracture toughness? And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to pull up the CES edu pack. Feel free to talk to your neighbors about it and try to argue about which one might be higher and which, which one might be highest, which one might be lowest.
bring it back together. So what are some of your thoughts on what might be the toughest and what might be the least tough materials in these? toughness so then I guess because I wrote ductile steel <laughs> then that one okay it does depend on temperature fracture is a fracture toughness is a material dependent property or is it material it's a temperature dependent property but say they're all at room temperature steel <laughs> It's a good question. Very ductile. Okay, how about which one do you think will be the least duct or at least have the lowest fracture toughness? Glass. Glass. Okay. Um, not plastic, even though it's way less stiff than the other material. Probably more brittle because it can absorb energy. Um, how about between? Aluminum and steel. Steel? Okay. So, for these particular materials, I'm going to show you a big Ashby plot of, of all these in a second. Um, for ductile steels, generally, yeah, this, this would have the highest fracture toughness, something like 170. And the units for this um, are weird. Uh, they're megapascal square root meters. So, because because that KIC is, is a yield strength and then there's a length dependence in there, the units end up having a, having a meter in there. So stress meter. The aluminum, uh, 7075 aluminum, which is a high, high strength aerospace grade aluminum, is something more like 29 uh, MPA root meters. Soda lime glass is very brittle. So it's something like 0.7. And ABS is, uh, even though it has a way lower stiffness, still absorbs a lot of uh, a lot of deformation so ABS is what um, plumbing materials are made out of so it's the it's the stuff that pipes uh, most of your like sewage pipes are um, or drainage pipes or whatever um, and so it can even though it's a lower stiffness it can deform a lot and absorb a lot of energy and that helps it to have a lower have a higher toughness so now I'm gonna pull up this Ashby plot of Modulus versus fracture toughness. Um, so this now, uh, again, this uh, CES EduPack is on the uh, on the College of Engineering website, so you all have access to this to play around with it. Uh, I think I had showed it sometime early on uh, in the quarter, but uh, here up at the top, metals and alloys, technical ceramics, non-technical ceramics. Uh, elastomers, natural materials, plastics are, or polymers are here in the middle, and then foams are down here on the side. So some of the toughest materials, some of the highest toughness materials are, are low alloy steels. So even though they may not be as strong, or nickel super alloys are up here, um, even though they may not be, low alloy steels may not be as strong as high alloy steels, they have, they're able to absorb more energy and prevent some of the fracture processes. Yeah. Is that one just beneath the metals and Ah, this is composites. Yeah. So this, so even though our, our CFRP epoxy, so this is that carbon fiber, even though it's inherently, both of the materials don't have a lot of toughness. So carbon uh, would probably be, I don't know, maybe somewhere in there. Silicon, we just saw tungsten carbides. E even though carbon isn't very tough intrinsically and epoxy isn't very tough intrinsically. So epoxy is somewhere in these in this polymer bubble, um, them combined, you actually get additional energy absorption deflection mechanisms because for carbon fiber composites, you have this, this pull-out mechanism where when you've heard all of those pinging noises and the fibers breaking randomly, uh, all those broken fibers are then able to slide out of the composite. Um, and you saw it kind of explode catastrophically during failure. Um, that, ex that explosion absorbs a lot of energy in the process. So it's actually, able to resist crack propagation pretty well, or not 
it's able to re resist crack propagation pretty well despite being made from brittle constituents. And so this is part of the engineering of materials that goes into composites. Um, okay, thanks everyone. On Friday, we'll have the recitation for the DIC lab, and then next week we'll be talking more about fracture.